Welcome back to the HPP podcast. I'm Rich Harris. Thank you for joining us again on our last episode. We focused on Tennessee and Dayton basketball with Vols guard Santiago Bescovi and Flyers big man Duran Holmes. Uh, you can listen to that episode or any other HPP episode at hoopsprospects.com. Check it out. Today I am joined by Drew Barton. Oh, wait. No, it can't be. Two trailer park girls go around the outside. Around the outside. Hey, hey, guess who's back? Back again. One more time. <laughs> He's back. Uh, Hugh, welcome back. Um, I know you've been really busy this summer. Uh, you have uh, at least one announcement for us, but uh, you were hanging out with uh, Drew Holiday and a lot of NBA folks. Uh, tell us some of your adventures uh, while you were gone. Yeah, guys, I've had a very busy summer, but a really eventful one. Obviously, I've been in San Diego all summer, so I've been making plenty of trips up to LA, one for an internship, but also for a lot of basketball workouts i've been lucky enough to become connected with a couple nba teams and spend a good amount of time out there working out players from a team and i'm super happy and excited to announce and it is a bittersweet moment but uh, i've just accepted recently a job with the milwaukee bucks in their video room and play development so this unfortunately will be my last hpp pod but i'm glad i was able to be here for the inaugural season and uh you know, be involved as much as I can. It's been an absolute pleasure to work amongst you, Rich. Drew, obviously, you guys have been great, and I've loved chatting hoops with you guys all summer, especially through the draft. That was a blast. So, yeah, I'm just excited to finish strong with this last part, and I'm just incredibly thankful for the opportunity so far. Well, uh, I I know – well, I won't speak for Drew because uh, Drew, Drew won't let me, but uh, uh, we're definitely going to miss you. Love your sense of humor. Just love talking to you in general. Um so yeah, this is uh definitely bittersweet, but very happy for you. And and what a uh who would have thought? Who would have thought, you know, just a few months ago that you would be in this position? But congratulations. Yeah, thank you. It's yeah, uh, I'm definitely gonna be tuned in next year too. I'm gonna be listening to you guys for all the insights, all the guys <laughs> coming out for the draft, trying to figure out who we should be aiming at in the draft next year. You guys are clearly gonna be the in depth analysis. So I'll be passing all the information along. Right. We're gonna give you the inside track. You're gonna know everybody. Those yeah. kids, those foreign-born players, you never heard of. We got you. Bucks are <laughs> stealing. Bucks steal of the draft every year. You, yeah, you guys are doing all the dirty work for me. <laughs> uh, you and you and uh, half a dozen other draft websites. <laughs> nah, we're yeah. better than them, Rich. Come on, now. Yeah. no, I meant we do the work for them. Uh, oh. <laughs> um. So you have to settle a debate that I had with with uh, Cam uh, in our last episode. I said that you had participated in the Pro Am this year, and it included some NBA players. Is that not true? Cam said you didn't you didn't play against NBA players. I didn't I didn't play against any NBA players, at least any current. Uh, I think some guys might have had short stints maybe in the G League that I played against. To be honest, I didn't know everybody that I did, but definitely some very high powered European players. Um, guys that are playing at some good clubs overseas and some very, very good college players too that either live in San Diego or a good amount of the San Diego State players were involved in the league. So I got to play against some very high talented players, but nobody that's currently in the NBA. Um, I believe Matt Bradley was one of those. Yeah, Matt Bradley and I had a battle in the semifinal. A lot of trash talk going back and forth, but he's a he's a really good guy. I've played a good amount of pickup with him now in San Diego, and yeah, he was he was a tough team to beat, and they got us in the semi, so that was unfortunate. Okay, alrighty. Um, so how are you, Drew? Um, I know uh, you have an announcement as well. I uh, believe yeah, my believer. Can you not make it yet? I mean, more or less, I guess I can. I haven't officially started. Uh, it's not an NBA team, but I'm going to be working with Stanford football and then hopefully Stanford basketball uh, for the remainder of this college football season into, obviously, um, when college hoops start. So I'm looking at a timeline. of We'll go through, obviously, conference play, bowl games. So I'll probably miss most of, if not all, the preseason for basketball. But I'm hoping to, and there's no guarantee on the basketball side, but transition from football into the basketball side of things once Pac-12 or well, soon to be Pac-10 play starts. So football is pretty much a lock at this point, uh, which is great. I'm um, big football guy as well. I have a lot of experience writing about the game, covering it, uh, working with players and stuff, but hoping to transition that to the to the basketball side of things with the men's and maybe even the women's team, uh, if I'm lucky, once conference play rolls around. 
All right, great. And uh, congratulations, Drew. Home nah, thank you, sir. Yeah, Stay very much. Home. Congratulations. And I know you had a couple other offers. Um, uh, so this job is going to be somewhat similar, I think, to what Hugh's going to be doing, except for you're going to also be working on the recruiting side, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll be doing uh, a lot of the film stuff I'll be doing. Uh, I won't be breaking down opposition film. Um, I'll be basically in charge of filming uh, all special teams practices, breaking down all the practice film for offensive and special team stuff. Um, and then just with the recruiting side, a lot of the nitty gritty that goes behind him. I and mean, he probably knows transcripts, interviewing people, just trying to get a read on the kids. I mean, Stanford has kind of another layer to the recruiting where the academics aren't pushed to the side. Like kids have to be eligible and meet the Stanford standard. And so just kind of making sure nothing falls through the cracks there. So um, that'll be fun. I mean, like I said, Hugh probably knows what it's like to have to deal with the recruiting process and, and go through all the visits and all that. So it's going to, it's going to be a good season. And then, like I said, hopefully I can get to the basketball side. I've been watching a lot of Harrison Ingram lately. So I know that <laughs> team pretty well. And he could he could be a good tight end for the football team. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, does Stanford play USC this week? Uh, no, we're by this week. Uh, USC is coming up, up though. He's already we. <laughs> oh, come on, guys! I like it. He's Have already to be. on board. Have to be. Wow! Wow! Get ready. How do you, you gotta have be ready a buy? to die on that hill? Didn't college football like start three days ago? You guys already have a buy. Yeah, it's it's honestly just scheduling stuff. It's not like the NFL where it's like a scheduled buy. You kind of make your schedule in football outside of yeah. your conference stuff, and so you kind of have to put your bye week early because you can't take a bye week in conference play. Like you got to play everybody, so yep. you got to usually do it in the first like three weeks. You got to take one. Yeah, usually, yeah. Um, so I have a couple more announcements. Uh, I'm quickly losing everyone that I've ever loved. Uh, <laughs> For, uh, for those of you uh, looking for Cam and Connor, uh, Cam is still with us, but his uh, appearances are going to be sporadic moving forward due to his day job as being a uh, VCR vendor in Times Square. Um, meanwhile, Connor's Xavier Simpson's website has been a huge success, and he is leaving us uh, for the time being, maybe forever. Uh, he will be devoting his full time to that effort. Um, thank you for your contributions, Connor. Um, actually, Connor, I know is still in school. Uh, so, um, and I think he may have gotten another internship, I believe. I'm not sure. Um, and Cam, of course, is a history teacher uh, at the, I believe, high school level or junior high level? I think high school level. Right. I think. So uh, that's where they really are. Um, so, all right. So should we, uh, after we got all those announcements in, should we move on to the NBA? We, uh, since our last show, we had a, we had a couple of weeks where we really didn't have much to talk about in the NBA, but finally we got some uh, interesting news over the last couple of weeks or few weeks. Um, we'll start off with the jazz trade. Uh, Donovan Mitchell to the Cavs for Colin Sexton. Ochai Abaji and uh, Laurie Markinen uh, and a bunch of draft picks too that the Jazz acquired. Um, we'll start with you, Hugh. Hugh, what 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 do you think about this trade? I think, I mean, I think this is a good trade for the Cavs. Obviously, the Cavs are, have a very talented young core, and this is now they're adding a scorer. They're adding a, a proven scorer in the NBA a guy who can score in bunches. Uh, and a lot of the conversation already has been around. Donovan Mitchell's defense and the playoffs last year against Dallas Mavericks and probably all of, or a majority of last season and whether that is an issue. But obviously with Cleveland, they have an incredible back line, Jared Allen and Evan Mobley that can sort of cover up for any defensive lapses that they might have in, in their guard rotation. So I think this is a huge pickup for the Cavs. They have immediately launched themselves from like a, a feel-good team in the East that everyone's excited for and happy for to now they're like, they can actually do some damage in the Eastern Conference, and they're not—they're not necessarily like a, a fringe potential in the play-in type of tournament. But they're a team that could be fighting for a potential home court advantage in the Eastern Conference this year. And I'm just really excited to see how that works, how Donovan Mitchell fits into this mix. Um, obviously, with Darius Garland running the show for that team last year. Um, uh, the thing that hurt me though was trading Ochai away. I thought Ochai had a, I was able to see him at summer league. He had, the game I saw, he played really well, and I think he 
performed really well in summer league. So that that was probably the the piece because we all knew Sexton was probably on his way out at some point. Markinum was a fun little experiment for them last year with the three seven footers. Um, but the Ochai piece was what sort of stung the most, in my opinion, for the Cavs. Drew? Yeah, so from a pure asset standpoint, I love this trade for the Cavs, um, just in terms of what was given and what was received. I mean, you kept Garland, you kept Allen, you kept Mobley, you kept Levert, you kept Isaac Okoro. Like, you still have a very solid core and just acquired a proven scorer. Fit will be interesting. I mean, I'm not really – I like Darius Garland overall, but he's not like a defensive stopper. We know Donovan isn't. Um, now, with Mobley and Allen around, you you do have a really strong front court. I mean, that rim protection between those two, you know, people are talking about Mobley as a future defensive player of the year candidate, and Jared Allen will contest anybody and everybody at the rim. So I think, I think overall it works out. And so, you know, I, I like the trade. Does it speed up the process of the Cavs and kind of lessen their margin for error? Um, absolutely. Like now the expectation is probably at least one playoff series when just looking at that starting kind of core. So if that doesn't hit, you know, that's the gamble you take. But, you know, I like Ochai. We've all talked about him. And I think he's a great fit. But I mean, when you're looking at draft picks, when you already have a really young core, you know, you can't keep adding young talent indefinitely or you turn to the Orlando Magic and you're just treading water. Um, they're not a huge free agent destination. So you're not going to get a star who wants to come, you know, regardless of all the LeBron James 2024 talk, it, this was the right move. I'm not the biggest Donovan Mitchell guy. So from a more personal standpoint, I don't know if I'd have given up this much for a player that can put up those points, but I kind of question his ability to lead a team, but maybe he doesn't have to be the leader. Like maybe Mobley, maybe Garland, they continue to ascend, become better than him. I think Mobley will at some point. And, you know, he kind of falls into that just two guard role where he just scores in bunches and, you know, the Cavs have to be happy with that. I mean, at the end of the day, you've got Sexton and and um, Donovan are relatively similar in terms of at least how they kind of – they're score first guards, and nobody's going to take Sexton over um, Donovan. So, I give – it's a good trade. I like the assets exchange. Cavs, Cavs still have a lot of young talent, and I think at, this is one of those moves where at worst they're going to win a few more games, and at best they might win a playoff series or two if it really does click. Let me ask you guys this. When was when did LeBron join the Heat? What year was that? Do we know? Roughly? Uh, Just uh, roughly. I don't know. 11. 2011. 2011. So I'm going to say 12 years ago, this trade would have never happened. Never, ever, ever happened. And if it did, everyone would have been saying the Jazz were the big winners. This is how the philosophy of the NBA has changed. Now you need that big name player. You need the big three, okay? And I'm going to argue that Donovan Mitchell is not worth three lottery picks and all those draft picks. Markinen was a lottery pick. Sexton was a lottery pick. And uh, Abaji, wasn't he a lottery pick? Or, yeah, uh, he was yeah. a lottery pick. Yeah, he was like so right at the tail end of it. Three lottery picks all in, all in their prime or before their prime. And I don't think Donovan Mitchell, I don't, if they would have done that trade without the draft picks or maybe one draft pick, I probably wouldn't be thinking Utah won, but I think Utah won. Um, and I'll tell you another thing that people aren't talking about. Backup point guard for Cleveland. They don't have one. Ricky Rubio is probably not going to be ready till, you know, the spring. Um the, they their backup shooting guard is Lavert, Lavert uh, who's often injured. Their um, starting small forward is either going to be Osman or Okoro. Uh, has Okoro lived up to his potential? Not even close yet. Okay, so and then backup power forward uh, is that Dean Wade? He's always hurt. Is that Lamar Stevens or is that Kevin Love? Um, do you want Kevin Love playing power forward? And then their backup center is Robin Lopez. Okay, that's serviceable. Um, you see where I'm getting at? This team has really suspect death. And if, and uh, you know, okay, so what are they going to do at point guard? Well, they're going to probably, uh, you know, make the minutes so that either Garland or Mitchell is always going to be there. One of those two guys is always, I guess, Lever also or Levert can also play point. 
But you know what I'm saying? I mean, they're going to have to go with a three-guard rotation pretty much right off the start of the season. And we're dealing with uh, – and we don't even know if Garland's durable. He's had injury troubles in, in, in his few years that we've known him. So I don't know. I just don't think this trade is going to work out. Um, I just don't. I think injuries are going to catch up with this team. Um, and – yeah, that's that's where we, that's where we go. And now Utah, if you look at their roster, yeah, actually, if you if you go on our depth charts and look at their roster, I think they have twenty three players right now on their roster. Um, yeah, oh 23, 23 players. But you know, look at some of their third string guys. I mean, Jared Butler, Jared Vanderbilt, uh, Azubuke. Um, I mean, they have Clarkson and Beasley are going to be coming off the bench. I mean, how many teams can say that I can bring Malik Beasley and Jordan Clarkson off the bench? Mm. You know, I mean, they're both like six man of the year types. One was. So I don't know if Utah's in such bad shape. Obviously, they're, you know, what if Kessler plays really well? If Kessler mm. plays really well, this might be a playoff team. I, 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 no, I can't go that far. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm because my, my thing is, and like, you know, I, I, when you watch the NBA, like it's clearly out of all the sports, the most star driven league. And it, I'm just looking at this. I'm like, Mike Conley is clearly all over the hill. He's still serviceable, but he's not, you know, borderline all-star Mike Conley. Sexton's coming off a knee injury. He's, you know, and he, he does one thing really well and that's score, but that's about it. Bogdanovich is a solid, you know, kind of three. He's serviceable. Markinen, Outside of last year, Markkinen was kind of flirting with that, like, not full-on bust, but, like, uh, does he really – What like, is, is he, he, like, 22, 23 years old? I mean – Yeah, I mean, yeah. and then, you know, Kessler is a rookie, so you give – I mean, I think I think Kessler will be will be fine. But, I mean, I, again, Abaji, I just – Abaji, at worst, is going to be a solid NBA player. You yeah. Know? yeah, but, I mean, solid doesn't win – at the no. highest All level right. in the NBA. All right. But here's, here's the deal. They're they're looking to trade Conley and Bogdanovich. Okay. Yeah. And, and, and Clarkson. If, and 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 Clarkson or Beasley. And, I mean, you really don't Beasley. want Clarkson and Beasley both on the same team. You really don't. The yeah. Same player. Yeah. You know? So um I just think you keep those three lottery picks you got from Cleveland. And if you get two more young guys, you know, in a few years from now, yeah, maybe they they'll turn into another Orlando Magic, where we look at the roster and say, wow, that's a lot of talent. Why don't they win more than 20 games a season? Or mm -hmm. they might be the Memphis Grizzlies, you know, fighting for second seed in, in the West. So I don't know. I, I'm just predicting in over the next five years, five years from now, we're going to say Utah got the better end of this deal. Mm. See, for me, I think the interesting part that I came out of this deal was is that I don't think either team's done making moves this season. I think Cleveland still has Kevin Love and Karis Levert that they will definitely be looking at. They can't afford to get rid of Levert. They can't afford to get rid of him. They don't have any wow. backcourt depth. Unless that's what they might do, though, with that potential a trade or something, get rid of him for backcourt depth. And then I think with Utah, we all know that they're sort of clearing house right now, too. So I think Conley's going to be on the move, potentially. I think Jordan Clarkson's on the move, um, potentially Beasley as well. So I just feel like there's still moves to be made. Um, the only thing with this was that getting all those Cavs drafts picks, like how confident are we that those are going to be good picks? We're, we're not. Under, we're not. Yeah, we're yeah. not. We're not. You know, in you know, unless you get like a top 15 pick, you know, it's a damn crapshoot. We, you know, I've been doing this long enough to know that draft picks aren't as much, aren't as valuable as, as people think they are. Uh, yeah. I get that. I get that. I'm talking about the three lottery picks they already have, plus mm -hmm. the potential to get, you know, good picks. Um, but you're right. You're right. You know, unless you know they're going to be, you know, like a top 10 pick, you know, you, it's a crapshoot. Um, I, I just want to say, I just want to make an announcement to tell you how the Cleveland Cavaliers, how uh, they're making some more moves today. <laughs> they signed, uh, remember I told you the longest, and I, Who's your, who's your boy from Point Loma, uh, Dalton Holmes? Remember, mm -hmm. I said that was the four longest hours of scouting in my life, and I then I I don't know if I corrected on air. I think I did, but I I didn't mean Dalton Holmes. I got him confused with a guy Cleveland signed today, and that's Chandler Vaudrin. Okay, from Winthrop, uh, he's a he's a point forward, um, and 
he's he he got signed by somebody last year, I think, on a two-way contract and ended up, I think, blowing out his knee. So he never actually played in an NBA game. Cleveland today signed him to an exhibit 10 and a Jamarco Pickett from Georgetown. Uh, Pickett actually, I thought, had some value as a European player, but that's where Cleveland's. <laughs> I'm just telling you, they're kind of scraping the bottom of the barrel right now yeah. to try to to find guys just to get on their training camp roster. So, uh, yeah. uh, all right. So let's move on to a less uh, intriguing trade, and um, and that was uh, the Lakers getting Patrick Beverly for Taylor, Taylor Horton Tucker, a guy I really like coming out of ho- college and, and like the Lakers picking him. But of course, any young talent, the Lakers, I think it's like, uh, I think it must be some kind of law in Los Angeles uh, that once the Lakers find a good, talented young player, they must get rid of him. The, uh, if you're LeBron if you're, James effect, baby. The LeBron right. James effect. That's and what it also, is. And they also uh, sent Stanley Johnson to Utah. So um, we didn't even talk about Taylor Horton Tucker and how he's going to fit on Utah because Utah's got so many players. But wh- what do you guys, Drew, I'll start with you. What do you think uh, of our one of our favorite teams of all time, the Los Angeles Lakers? Oh, I love the chaos. This won't work. <laughs> There's no way. What do you think about Beverly? You, you, oh, you think Beverly's going to be – is this going to be uh, a nightmare? Oh, it's it's going to be a comp- – uh, yeah, th- this is not going to work. The, the Lakers are so desperate – that you are actively bringing in a player that four or five months ago was calling you trash, was insulting Westbrook to his face, slapping LeBron on the butt, telling him, like, hey, better luck next year. And I understand that that's what Beverly does. And, like, that's what he's a, he's a disruptor. He's a chaos causer. Like, I totally get it. And I like Patrick Beverly because you need a guy like that. But this Lakers team is so fragile that – you're literally I mean you didn't just light a match you brought a flamethrower like this is going to go so poorly if Russ plays bad which I think he will how like Beverly's the type of guy to go into a press conference and go yeah Russell Westbrook is killing this team and and Russ couldn't handle being called Russell Westbrook and went on a tire about how I'm being disrespected and my family can't come to games Dude, I've been called much worse at pickup games at the University of San Francisco's gym <laughs> and took no offense to it. And I'm not making 20, 30, 40. I'm not making $47 million a year. There's no way this works. I like Patrick Beverly. It's going to be a circus. Look, the Lakers, healthy Anthony Davis, healthy LeBron. They're definitely probably a play-in team. Those two guys alone are going to get you there. But you look at this roster, and I'm like, Russell Westbrook is your third best player, and Patrick Beverly is your starting point? What? what? This doesn't make any sense. They are going to be a mess. I think those. Hope I think God. they'll. Start, I think they'll start together. Actually, I yeah. Mean, if I was a coach of that team, I think the way it's set up, you need somebody who will play off the ball, won't won't yeah, want the ball, won't demand the play touches, defense. Yeah. So I think Beverly might be a nice fit, but you know, uh, Beverly to me is still. Uh, I mean, I know he's improved over the years, but he's not really the he's kind a of role guy player. You, you don't want. But you also yeah. don't want him being your two guard because he's yeah, not a great he, shooter. You know, and of course, he's a role player, right? He By the way, when, pe- the wolves. when people called West Brook West Brick, did they put it in air quotes? <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, the way those fans treat him, they probably were saying a lot. They were probably throwing some explicits in there. <laughs> explicits. I'll just end with this. The Lakers, if AD and LeBron are healthy, they are going to be better. That's a fact. You're adding two top-tier talents to the team for an extended period of time. You will be more competitive. But to think that this team, with the moves that they have made, are going to be anything more than a playing team, maybe a you know, maybe win a game or two in a series just off of the sheer star power is, in my opinion, not going to happen. Lakers are, are toast. Right. Yeah. I agree. Hugh? Yeah, I think Drew Drew's right, too, that the Beverly trade is, for me, purely just a good one for entertainment value for the NBA. Like, <laughs> this is going to be such a good entertainment team to watch to see how this all unfolds, how this – how long Westbrook is really going to be there for. Can they coexist with each other? And I'm just – Super excited to see how that unfolds. And I mean, if Anthony Davis is healthy and if Anthony Davis is committed to playing defense like he did in the bubble and that season, then then this is a huge plus because then they have a good guard who wants to play defense and wants to be scrappy mm-hmm. on that end. And then they can have a rim protector. So I hope the Lakers are healthy because then obviously, like you said, we're going to see a better team and that's better for the NBA. And I hope it does pan out in the sense that they are a competitive team next year and Patrick Beverly can be sort of a leading driver and hopefully get out of Anthony Davis's skin a little bit and be like, you are this talent, you're a million times more talented than I am. How am I playing better than you? Right. Hopefully that is something that spurs them on. Absolutely. Right, right. 
By the way, every time I hear you talk, Q, uh, and and I'm not just saying this, I, I, I actually believe you're going to be a coach someday because, you know, you just have that – you have that uh, Popovich mindset. I'm serious, you know, and oh. that European mindset. And I think the game ultimately is going to go that direction. Um, but uh, uh, I appreciate yeah. that, Rich. Very nice of you. I agree. And uh, comparing I, myself to Pop, I, I mean, I I'll, expect... I'll be compared to Pop every day of the week. <laughs> um, and I expect to be on your scouting staff for the draft. Um, you my advisory board, both of you. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I, I wanted to bring up something else. Oh, I know what I wanted to do. Uh, before we uh, reach on to the next topic, I just want to remind you guys that we have our first listener question is about the Nets. So try either we can talk about that. I guess we'll we'll go into that right now because the topic we were going to talk about is now that, you know, that basically Kevin Durant is shortly right after our last episode, uh, the, the Nets announced everything was copacetic and they were staying together. So do you want to address the, the our listener question is about the Nets outlook for next season. You want to save that for the mail back bag section or do you want Let's to throw it in here? We'll it's all it kind of one in the so same. Kevin, Kevin Durant that, is that the question. Net. So we'll put in our comments about Kevin Durant staying, but uh, Kyle asked, um, with the KD situation settled, what's your outlook for the Nets this season? Very simple question. Uh, not a so simple of an answer. So we'll start with you, Hugh. Um, we know Kevin Durant is apparently staying put. What do you make of that situation now that it's at least for now, you know, settled? I guess. Um, and where do you, where do you see the what do you see the Nets doing for the season? Now I know. Uh, well, uh, I, I wish I had the answers. I mean, we know that the Nets are an incredibly talented team and we know they have very skilled players, guys who know how to score the ball. But the biggest thing that was the problem last year and let's hope it's fixed this year is just being able to play as a team. Um, wanting to play for each other, wanting to play together and winning basketball games together as a unit, that's going to be the biggest thing for the Nets because, I mean, they can win plenty of games playing by themselves, playing for themselves and not for the team but that's not going to take them very far when the playoffs come around. So I think for me, great that Kevin Durant's back. I would, I would have been really mad if he was on another team and just really bought into this trend of bouncing around. I hope that this is a, that this piece that they've come to is actually real and that he is now invested in the team and he's now invested in the organization. But the biggest swing thing for me now is Ben Simmons in that team. That's the guy they went out and they traded their, one of their big three to replace as their other part of the big three. So if Ben Simmons is playing like some of what we've seen he can do in Philadelphia a few years ago now, then I think that could be a huge positive for the team. But he is the swing piece now because we know what we're getting out of KD and Kyrie. We know that they have a good amount of role players who can shoot the ball. Um, but I want to see, is Ben Simmons going to be committed to the defensive end? One, is he going to play? Like how, how often is he going to play? I think if Ben Simmons plays 70% of this season, I think the Nets have a pretty solid season. Drew? Yeah, Hugh, I mean, he hit the nail on the head. And I think what it boils down to is that you look at the top teams in the East, Celtics, Bucks are for sure the one two. Um, I would say the Heat are up there. What do those kind of all have in common? It's a culture thing. Different cultures, but it's a culture thing. They're led by players who put in the work. Giannis puts in the work. Jimmy puts in the work. Tatum and Brown have put in the work to get better. They have strong coaches. They have strong front offices. Like those are culturally sound organizations. There's and the Nets can't the Nets can't beat them. I mean, the reality is if the Nets run into any, particularly the the Bucks or the Celtics in the first round, they'll lose in the first round again. They might be able to out talent the Heat. That that could happen. But those two teams at the top, they cannot beat them because, like you said, can they beat the Sixers? Sixers too. I mean. They cannot beat those top teams because I genuinely question if it's what they want to do. Would Ke would Kyrie be okay getting swept if he put up 35, 5, and 5 on 50, 40, 90? I think the answer to that might be yes. Yeah. Kevin Durant, a little bit more competitive. I'll give him that, but kind of the same thing. Ben Simmons is – I have no – I'm done with Ben Simmons. I'm out on him. Until he averages 40, 15, and 15, I'm done. I don't want anything to do with him. So that's the question, and the answer to me is no. They're, they are at best going to get to the second round, run into one of those culture teams, and they're going to lose. That's going to happen. All right. Um, 
yeah, you, you know, my first thought when I when I saw Kyle's question was, uh, you know, these guys have arguably three of the top five biggest pain in the asses in the league on their team. And uh, Hugh was correct in saying they do have decent depth. They've done a nice job of feeling Patty Mills, Joe Harris, TJ Warren, Nick Claxton, Markeith Morris, assuming that they come off the bench. Now, I think Seth Curry. Yes. Well, I'm putting Seth in the starting lineup, but um, and Royce O'Neill, the uh, newly acquired Royce O'Neill, and where I have Ben Simmons, and I predicted this when he was when uh, he was sitting on the bench right after the Harden trade. I said Simmons's future was as a point center, and I know I have from a very reliable source know that Simmons still can't shoot. OK, and um, so he's not going to be any different. And so I think he's going to start at center at that team. I don't think you want Nick Claxton starting. I don't think you want Marky Morris starting um, and Dayron Sharp. You know, I think Ben Simmons is going to be that center and uh, Claxton and Morris coming off the bench. Um, but, OK, let's say Ben works as a point center, but you still have. You know, Durant, uh, well, usually he plays well when he's motivated, and he's usually motivated. But then you have Kyrie. You know, for all we know, he could mix, miss 60 of 80 games. We never know what's going to happen with him. There's just too much stuff that's going to go wrong. You know, you need Simmons to adjust, and if they still keep him as like a small forward or power forward. And, and, and you know, Simmons really, ironically, for someone who can't shoot, he actually needs the ball in his hands to actually – function he's the worst oxymoron in the nba yeah yeah in my so, opinion you know i mean you know with the sixers you know basically he would dribble down and if he couldn't get right to the rim he would kind of post up in the lane and yeah and um so yeah i i agree the way drew put it you know the, the, they're not they're not gonna get uh they're probably the best hope i think is the final four in the eastern conference you know, that's their best hope. So, all right, here we go. So, moving on to the next thing is uh, the Sixers, uh, I believe yesterday or the day before, assigned Montrez Harrell, uh, former sixth man of the year with the Clippers. Um, Hugh, what what are your thoughts on uh, Sixers bringing in Montrez? I like it. I think it's a good bench pickup. Uh, we know he's a high-energy player. And he brings toughness. Um, he's definitely not the most polished player in the game. But this is a – I think Montrez Harrell, now that he's got through whatever he was getting through this summer, I think this is a good value pickup for your second unit. A guy that you know cares about winning and plays with passion. And I could see some lineups where he's playing alongside Joel that could be really successful. If Joel's got the ball around the foul line or even further out the three-point line, you could have Montrez in the dunker spot. Uh, he doesn't necessarily space the floor that well, but – I like this pickup for the Sixers. I think this is a good veteran guy who clearly knows what he needs to do and how he can contribute to winning in the league. Yeah, absolutely, Hugh. I mean, this is this is the East is turning into an arms race. I mean, these teams are gearing up. I mean, you look at the top teams and everyone's got two, three big name players, rotation pieces, and this is a guy who isn't that far removed from a six man of the year. Um, I I agree that I could see him figuring out a way to play alongside Embiid because Embiid is just so – he's so multifaceted. You don't just have to stick him – he doesn't have to stay at the rim the whole time where Montrez kind of does. Um, I, I think that this is one of those signings where you're – I don't know the length. Is it two years? I think it was – was it a two-year deal? Two, two-year two. deal. So it's, you know, you put – hopefully the Sixers put it all together this year. But regardless of you go into the next season, you have, you know, your backup center – who is a proven contributor who has who has won and had some playoff success, has a six man of the year on his resume. So, you know, for when you know Embiid is is due to miss a few games here or there with some, you know, tic tacky things, this is the type of guy you bring in and you know he's used to that role on the bench and he can thrive in it. So I like it. Yeah. When we were when we talked about the signing of uh, PJ Tucker, you know, I still said I was still concerned about the Sixers front court depth. I just didn't know if Paul Reed and Charles Bassey and some of the other guys, you know, they had were 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 enough. And uh so I think this solidifies, you know, one of the six probably the Sixers biggest hole. Um 
I am a little concerned about what happened with Harold this off season. I won't go into detail, but um, you know, not a not a good indication. And the other thing was, you know, the year the year that he won six man of the year in the playoffs. I've never seen a player be less inspiring on the defensive end. I mean, the guy just quit at times. And uh, you do think of him as a high-energy player. But, um, yeah, so I, I don't know what happened then. I, I've never really noticed up until those playoffs of him being, you know, uh, a huge defensive liability. But he certainly was that particular playoff season. Um, but – I think you can play Harold and Tucker together, uh, Harold and Embiid together. Um, and so they could still keep, you know, Bassey as their third, you know, power forward. And uh, they and they still have Niang and Paul Reed as other, other guys they can use uh, at power forward. So, yeah, I, de I definitely uh, do like the move. Uh, and it wasn't costly, you know. I mean – one last thing on that, Rich. I think when you look back at Harold, you know, with those Clippers run, we're near the end there. I think a lot of that team trying to just quit on each other. He's not going to work. This type of player, Patrick Beverly, they're not going to work with a Kawhi Leonard. They're not going to work with a Paul George. You hear all the stories of how they were showing up to practice late. Kawhi wasn't even living in the area. Just all those things. A guy like Montrezl Harrell is not going to really – that's not going to fly with him. So I think it was more so he gave up on – just the Clippers culture did a big turn from the year prior when they were, you know, and I think that just rubbed them the wrong way. Philly, I, I think, is a place where the fans are hard on you. It's kind of that tough yeah. nose, grinded out culture. I mean, we think of Embiid as a fun-loving guy, but Embiid's a competitor. Like, I, I firmly yeah. believe Embiid's a competitor, uh, you know. So I, I think this is a much better fit. And, you know, guys like this have to be motivated. And I think at that point he was just like, I don't want to be here. I don't respect Kawhi as a competitor. I think he just checked out. I don't think that'll be a problem in Philly. Right. Another positive about this story is, you know, uh, James Harden was, you know, the the guy who, you know, recruited Harold to come to Philly. Another sign that, that Harden is engaged. Um, now, will it last? Well, I don't know. But it might be that Philly is starting to grow on Harden, you know, because yeah. if you – you know, it really doesn't matter if you play poorly as long as you're given 100%. I mean, look at Fultz. They never really got down on Fultz. You know, I mean, Philly is, you know, as long as you give an effort, as long as you're trying, Philly will love you. Absolutely. All right. So our last big item in the NBA uh, is about Chet Holmgren uh, being lost for the season with a torn ligament in his foot. Never want to hear foot injuries for basketball players. Uh, some kind of, they're the type of things that can haunt you uh, throughout your career, uh, though that has gotten better with the advance of medicine. Um, Drew, uh, what do you think, uh, what are your thoughts on Holmgren missing his rookie season? He'll be a rookie next year, actually. But uh, ah, man, this is, a, this is a heartbreaker for me because, you know, you never want to see young guys go down with, with injury. I mean, he hasn't got a chance to really show, you know, what he can do at the highest level in actual NBA competition. Um, you know, I go back to the play, he got hurt, and it's funny. I've had this debate with people, and they were going, Oh, LeBron just steamrolled him. If you watch the play, he gave ground, contested the shot, forced LeBron into a really bad, difficult layup attempt, and he just landed funny. Like, it wasn't like LeBron put his shoulder into his chest, backed him down, and Holmgren tripped over his own feet and broke his ankle. Like, he he actually made a relatively solid basketball play. So, it's a uh, it sucks. Um, yeah, like you said, foot injuries are tough. Foot injuries for big guys are tough. The saving grace is he's not a 300 pounder where it's, you know, the weight won't be as big of an issue. Um, but, yeah, I, I just – I feel bad for Chet. I mean, he probably had – not probably. He had the most questions and doubters around him because of his frame. And, you know, between college, uh, the summer league, like he was showing that he belonged and that he looked like he could carve a role out for himself, how big of a role is to be determined. But, yeah, this just sucks. And, um, you know, I, I feel bad for the guy. I was really looking forward to seeing him play. Nobody expected anything from the Thunder, but – you know, he's going to be one of those kind of unicorn players and we don't get to see him. And I, I really hope this doesn't impact him long term because I think Chet's got a career ahead of him. Yeah. Hugh? Yeah. Yeah. Drew said it best. I mean, I feel bad for the for the guy. He uh, he didn't ask for this a complete accident, like you said, watching the play. So it's ultimately out of his control. But I mean, even before he got injured, there was a lot of debate this summer about should NBA players be playing in these right. round games? And now that he is injured, obviously a lot of people – all of a sudden come out of the woodwork. Oh, I knew all along why why are they why are these teams letting these guys play. And I think with that is that 
the context needs to come into some of these decisions. It shouldn't be like a yes, you can play, no, you can't. I think for a guy like Chet, who's had an incredibly busy last year, coming off playing college basketball season, then goes through the whole pre-draft process, works out for all these teams. Obviously, he's working out an incredible amount. Then goes to Summer League. I was lucky enough to watch him play a game at Summer League. And like his talent and potential, it slaps you across the face. Like it's all there. But what I also saw is that he's incredibly fragile. And like we all know with his frame, it needs weight. It needs strength. And so I think for OKC, they're probably pretty frustrated with themselves right now to the point where they're like, how do we let this happen? How do we let, sure, if if Shea Gilgis Alexander came to them and said, I want to play Pro-Ams, you can have a good confidence to be like, okay, he's been in the league. He knows his body. He's got a good core. He knows how to play. He's not going to be out there. And there's a very limited risk of him getting hurt. For for your number two pick in the draft, for a guy that you're hoping can be a franchise guy going forward, I think you need to have the wherewithal to be like, okay, he's just come off a really tough six months, a lot of basketball, a lot of playing. Let's get him to OKC and let's focus right now on building his body for the next season, starting to work on his body, which I'm sure they are. I'm sure he's been in OKC working through that. But I think there should have been some greater context understood in this and said, you don't need to go to Seattle Pacific University and look good in front of 600 people right now. It's going to look cool on Instagram, but that's not what we need from you right now. And I think, well, I mean, I'm sure OKC is very frustrated with themselves that they allowed him. And I mean, Paolo is a different case. You look at Paolo's body, he's probably prepared right now to play a significant amount of basketball. But Chet, I think there should have been another step in this thought decision process. And ultimately, he probably shouldn't have been playing in as many. I mean, he was playing in so many of them. I feel like a month ago, every yeah. time I was on Instagram, he was playing in a pro-am in Seattle. So it's like, how many games did he actually play? That might have been his third or fourth one. Um, so yeah. obviously it's it's not something that they knew was coming this is an accident but there is a potential that this could be a positive in where a year's time sort of like how Ben Simmons and Embiid did they get that year under their belt they get comfortable they get a full year of rehab and weight training and hopefully for his real rookie season next year he comes back even better prepared to go and make an even greater impact yeah, I, I actually think you both made some excellent points, and I do agree, Hugh. I mean, I, I, I'm generally for, you know, players playing in the mm-hmm. offseason, especially when it's something like, you know, uh, uh, Euro, uh, the Euro Cup that's going on right now. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I don't think you should prevent someone from wanting to play for their country. Um, and But in the case of Holmgren, with his body type, um, yeah, I, I think you're right. I think getting him on a better diet and so forth should have been the top concern. Also drew made an excellent point in that he's not heavy. And that's one of the biggest things with foot injuries. Um, you know, the more weight you carry, the more, t- the more likely they are to occur and, uh, probably, you know, uh, to bounce back from, uh, so what I'm hoping as Hugh pointed out is he should, should be able to work on his upper body. No problem. You know, we could probably be doing that right now. Uh, But uh, lower body, you know, it might be a little bit more difficult uh, to work on his upper body or lower body right away. But uh, I think, and that's probably the most important thing for him to increase his strength in his quads, his core, uh, calves, uh, ankles, things of that nature. Um, So, yeah, uh, both made excellent points. Uh, So we'll move on to uh, college basketball now. And Drew continues to do some uh, film study uh, as he becomes uh, more familiar. What's the tool you're using again? Uh, Huddle Sports Code. It's um, right, basically right. kind of a one-stop shop for right. downloading Huddle, games. Huddle used to be, it still is huge for soccer, uh, mm-hmm. uh, but I guess it's now catching on the basketball world too. Um, so you taught you uh, recently did analysis of Drew Timmy. Marcus Sasser, Deron Holmes, they're all on your YouTube page? Yeah, so I created just a a YouTube page because they were too long to post on Twitter. So I was putting them on LinkedIn, trying to put them on Twitter. So I created a YouTube page. Um, I honestly think it's just like Drew Barton, like hyphen aspiring basketball scouters, analysts, um, (laughs) just because they're all four or five minute long kind of clips for guys. Um, The whole process was pretty simple. Uh, I went through each player. Uh, regardless of how familiar I was with them, downloaded three games. I tried to pace it out like end of the year, middle of the year, kind of beginning of the year, tried to find better competition. I didn't need to watch Drew Timmy score 45 against Alcorn. That didn't right. do me anything. Um, went through the games, just kind of, you know, went in with an idea of like what they do well, what they don't do as well. 
um watch tried to watch the game just through uh, like not worry about clipping and editing just to watch it to get a feel for how they're you know what their play style is like and then um go back in download their minutes played and just kind of then it gets a little bit tedious you're just clipping through watching 10 second possessions over and over and over again looking for the right post move or the right pass or the footwork or whatever you're trying to look at so i really enjoy doing it and I also did an edit on Viscovi. I, I probably watched in the last couple of days. Oh, you did? Uh, oh, I didn't know you did. Yeah, I did one. I, 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 I'm and not I done know with you, yet. I know you're close to finishing up Omari Moore. Yeah, I'm not done with Viscovi's yet. That one in, in Omari, I have all the cliffs. I just got to put the film together. But it's a good time. I mean, it's a lot of basketball to consume. And it's a very unique way to watch the game. I mean, I, the three of us are kind of used to it. But you're kind of just keying in on one guy. You're not worried about necessarily the set. You're not worrying about are they in a man or are they switching to zone. Like you're just watching one player and. You have to be aware of what a team wants right. to do, but right. and no, for those, I don't. Yeah. For those of you who have never done what we do, I mean, we, we look at all kinds of things, including uh, body language, too. You know, yeah, things, of that, that, things of that nature that maybe people don't even think about. But we're fo- co- constantly focusing on that one guy. Um because if you watch the ball, or I mean, you got to keep an eye on the ball too. Of think. course, yeah. Especially, especially uh, defensively, or if you're trying to evaluate his passing, you have to be aware of the whole court, just like you would if you're playing. But um, yeah, uh, scouting is much different than just appreciating game as yeah. a fan. Harrison Ingram uh, is a good one to watch for body language. You want to watch body language player Harrison Ingram from Stanford? Not just because I'm working there, right. but um, he's a good one to watch for body language. Okay. Very vocal, good, you know, head up, clapping, even on the bench, kind of stuff. He's a good one to watch. Right. You mentioned tedious editing, by the way. You, you should try doing this show. Um, <laughs> uh, so moving on. So uh, give us give us give us a quick uh, breakdown on the on the five guys. Uh, Timmy, Sasser, Holmes, uh, Vescovi and more. Now, I know we we recently we talked a lot about right. Holmes and Vescovi uh, last week because they were both guests on the show. But, uh, yeah, g- give us an overview on all five guys and we'll throw in some thoughts if we have any. Yeah. So Drew Timmy, uh, amazing first name, uh, first and foremost. Uh, he's my favorite player in college basketball, has been now for, I guess, the past two years. Uh, first and foremost, because of the personality. I think that's something that college basketball still has over the NBA is personality shines through. I mean, how many 22 year olds are running around handlebar mustaches and headbands and giving people 25 and eight a game? Not many. Um, Obviously when you think about Timmy, in my opinion, the first thing is that he is probably one of the best finishers in the country at the rim. And he's the best pure post player. You know, you think we think of finishing and we think of highlight dunks and fancy layup packages we don't think about a guy just throwing hook shots in the paint. and But Drew, Tim, and the way this guy plays basketball, he is so fundamentally sound. I mean, to watch a player establish a pivot foot, you know, one, two dribbles, feel the – like literally take the time to feel where the defender's at on his body. Is he leaning – you know, is he trying to play me over the top? How is he playing me? And then make a move and then a counter move and then finish with his left hand. I mean, this is the stuff that, you know, AAU coaches and high school coaches dream of. And Timmy does it to the highest level. Um, I think he's a really underrated passer. I know the Zags have a very good team generally, so it does make his job a little bit easy, but he had some awesome high-low post action with Holmgren where he was hitting Holmgren over the top. He hit Chet for a great alley-oop in a game against Alabama where kind of I was like, oh, wow, that's impressive. I didn't think you had that in your bag. Um, And then there's some shooting upside. I mean, he's not at the volume you want to be from an NBA big, which is why he's not a first-round pick as well as the fact that he's not overly athletic. But, you know, if you watch the combine games, which I went back and I watched some of those as well for these guys, he was seven for seven from the free throw line. I think he was five for eight for three total. So there's potential there. And, you know, my favorite game of the year was hit him against Memphis when he went up against Dern and that big front court and Josh Minot and all those guys. And I mean, not only was he doing his thing in the post, but you want to talk about big shots, facing up defenders, mid-range shots, catch, shoot on the three. I mean, just Drew Timmy's a winner. It's not, it, and, was, it wasn't just Duran either. I mean, that was one yeah. of the best, if not the best defensive team in the country. Yeah. You know, you know two years ago, he did the same thing against uh, Mobley, Evan Mobley, who people are talking about as a future defensive player of the year in the tournament. I think, and we've gotten so far removed sometimes where we're like the analytics, the shooting, the athleticism. I think there should be something said about a guy who wins. And yes, he's a fun loving guy, but he's a competitor. You watch him play. He's a competitor. He wants to an win. involved, involved competitor. You know, yes. I mean, he 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 really pushes his teammates, uh, makes suggestions to coaches. Absolutely, you know, things like that. 
Yeah. So I, I love Drew Timmy. There's, big, big there's fan. The two two big concerns I, I you know I think we have is just shooting because uh, the way the NBA plays, they don't want people clogging up the paint. Absolutely. Um, and uh, defense. And I think as long as he can do one of those two things, he'll be a regular in the NBA. Well, it's funny. We actually did a couple of scouts and I sat down a while ago and we did like a defensive study on forwards and centers on switchability. And basically we get fed a bunch of data through. Now this is with a caveat. He had Chet Holmgren, one of the best rim protectors in the country behind him. And he had Nemhard, Strother, spearheading the defense at the perimeter. But Timmy actually managed well enough in because of the IQ. He dropped when he had to drop. He heads when he had to. He did a lot of things right, the small things. Now, obviously, like Rich said, the athleticism is a question. Like, it's one thing to hedge against, you know, Khalil Shabazz and Jabari Bouye, um, Jamari Bouye from USF. It's another yep. thing to do yep. it against Kyrie Irving. Exactly. But I, he, he, I, I think he's going to be the guy you get in the second round, and he's just going to stick around on your roster for years. Like, you're going to look at him kind of like um, he played for OKC, uh, the center, Smith. Forget, he played for OKC for years. Um, I think his name was Nick something. Drawing a blank Hashem, on him. Hashem Thibate. Oh, Collison. Nah, he, Nick Collison. Nick Collison. I feel yeah, like he has a, okay. a Nick Collison kind of floor from the standpoint of just like he's going to just be around and he's going to be a positive influence on the team. And if he finds his way on the court, yeah, he's not going to get post touches 10 times a game. But with his finishing ability, I totally see him running a pick and roll, catching the ball as the roll man and finishing with either hand at the rim. And if teams want to go small, He's still 6'10". He'll finish over you if you give yeah. him a chance. So yeah. I love you, Timmy. I, I think he's better than another guy from his alma mater in, in Olenek. Oh, yeah. I think, I think yeah. ultimately he, he'll be – I think that's the worst case scenario is yeah. Kelly Olenek type of player. Totally. Um, right. We got Marcus Sasser next. You know, Sasser is kind of a hard player to look at because he was hurt most of last year. Uh, he had a foot injury. He was having a career year career year now again that was another caveat that i had when i watched a lot of their games early on were blowouts and they didn't play the highest level of competition i mean i was debating him with another guy that i was scouting with and he was talking about sasser's elite perimeter defense he was averaging almost two and a half steals a game and i was like dude they played alcorn and he had like eight steals in one game and he only played a third of the season like pump, pump the brakes on elite perimeter defense and you want to talk about playing in a great system kelvin sampson man that houston defense is legit and so he's kind of a – he's what I like to call a controlled chaos kind of guy. He just kind of thrives in that, you know, mayhem because all it takes is one guy to kind of lose his handle or one guy to throw a sketchy pass, and he just jumps the lane. But, I mean, he's a shooter. I mean, when you look at Sasser, he was at almost nine attempts a game, I think eight and a half, and he was shooting 44%. It was insane. Right. I mean, he had some games where – and he, we're talking NBA range, off the dribble, step back, catch and shoot. I mean, he had one where he was running in transition against – I want to say it was – I think it was a UVA and he's running down in transition, catches the ball, gets his feet set behind the line and lets it rip in one motion. And I was like, that is an NBA, that's NBA caliber shooting ability. Um, I mean, the foot injury does kind of concern you. We just talked about it. Um, but for the bright side, he came back, played in the combine. And I know Rich, who we talked about combine way back when he played pretty well in the combine played, I think almost 30 or sorry, 23 yeah, he played, minutes. He played very well. It was yeah. G, G league elite camp. Uh, but yeah, he, he played very well. Yeah. Um, so, but I think, I think he's, I okay. think the reason he pulled out is not because he didn't play well. I think he pulled, he pulled out because he's like, hell, I was in the midst of my best college season. Uh, next year, I'm even going to have more of a, a role. Um, I think he thinks he might be able to sneak in the end of the first round. Oh, yeah. If Sasser plays as he did this past season for the duration of an NCAA season and they make a bit of a tournament run, Sweet 16, Elite 8, he will go into the first. I'm predicting right now 25 to 30 will be where he goes if he plays this, if he keeps that momentum going. Right. Now, we we have to keep in mind Sasser's only like six foot two. So I think the one thing where he needs to improve and he might not get that opportunity at Houston this year because they they have a very good point guard in, uh, uh, I think it's Jamal or Jamer Sneed. Yeah, Um, Jamal Sneed. And uh, so so he's one of the best passers in the country, Sneed is. Uh, Now, Sasser, for his career, I think he's like, you know, 1.6, 1.7 career assist turnover ratio. Yeah, I think last year was his career high. And I think what what he is going to need to do at the NBA is show that he can play, uh, can be a distributor and not always a shooter, um, because uh, yeah, you need that. But we we do know he can play defense. Um, 
you know, but you know, there's always limitations when you're six foot two. Uh, so I think I think the missing piece in his game is passing. So he might not be able to get maybe because he's going to be the main guy this year. He might not be able to get much over uh, three assists per game. But is, if he can keep that assist turnover ratio, to, if he can get it up to like two. You know, people are going to be thinking, hey, I could play this guy at the point guard if I have to. Um, and, you know, have a nice guy coming off the bench, give you an offensive Absolutely. spark. Yeah. So my, my comp for him was Malik Monk in a lot of ways uh, for the Lakers. Er, early with Charlotte, obviously, there were some issues. Well, but Monk, like, Monk, at- Monk was a pretty damn good athlete. I don't know. If- he's, he's not the athlete, but I'm talking like from a role. I look at what Monk did for the Lakers this last year in that oh, role. Right, right, That's right. the role. Yeah, physically, Monk is finished at the rim. I mean, Sasser is a shooter. Like, he's getting his buckets from the three-point line and the foul line. That's what he does. Monk is was much more explosive, especially in college, all, all over the court, basically. But in a role standpoint, he can definitely be that sixth, seventh guard who can take some point guard duties, knock down shots so he can play off the ball if he needs to. Um, the big thing for him is going to be passing and then just uh, the shot selection. He takes some really bad shots because he has that green light. He's got to tone that down the NBA. You're not getting eight and a half, nine, three attempts a game. You're getting two or three, and you better can those at 40% if you want to stick. Right. Um, How about uh, Vescovi and Holmes? Do you do you have much to add on? Uh, I, I love two? Holmes, man. I love Holmes. Uh, watching him play was fun. He definitely is – very much so in that traditional rim running, rim protecting big mold right now. Like all the games I watched, um, he was didn't really leave the paint. Uh, but man, if this kid can find a bit of a jump shot, even if it's just a stretch out to the short corners and the elbows up at the free throw line, he's going to be a, a load. He plays super hard. He has legit shot blocking instinct, like quick second. I mean, he block. I mean, I literally would watch him block a shot, be back up off the ground, block a shot. Um, he does have the athleticism. At times, I saw him jump out on the perimeter a little bit, hold his own. I mean, obviously, you don't want your center stepping out on a point guard consistently, but he didn't have a problem getting out there, um, hedging a screen, dropping, and you know, contesting at the rim. I, he doesn't foul. I love right. the fact yes. he just does not foul. I think he averaged almost two and a half blocks a game and less than two fouls a game. Yep. And to me, that's a, that just shows a high level, not just athlete, but a high IQ. Um, the one thing, and Rich, you and I talked about this before, rebounding consistency, um, you know, his role at next season and in the NBA is going to be kind of that Jared Allen, like just rim runner, finish at the rim and contest everything. And so if he's not going to be a double-double threat in his minutes, you know, you kind of wonder like, okay, well, I'm going to get you. You're going to crash the glass, but are you coming away with the boards? And he plays a lot of minutes and lives in the paint. His rebounding percentage, um, if you look at his total rebounding percentage, was was pretty unimpressed. I think it was actually, it was lower than Drew Timmy's, uh, who you don't think of as a big rebound guy right. uh, when I did right. the comparison. But I love this kid. I love. Okay. We had a well, great interview with him. Yes, we did. Uh, it, it was fun, and uh, uh, he's definitely a bright kid as well. Um, if you it, right now, as they stand, as their game stands, and has and as you project them to develop this season. Um, who would you take first in the draft, Holmes or Timmy? I think you have to take Holmes just off of the fact that he has NBA athleticism and he has a tangible skill that every NBA team needs, and that's rim protection. Timmy's skill sets are more complementary. Like, you would like to have a good finisher. You would like maybe a nice little post passer. But his his main key element of that post-scoring doesn't exist in the NBA. Whereas Holmes, you're like, I've got a 6'10 athlete who runs the court hard, can test at the rim, and if he can get the rebounding numbers up, is going to just be a menace for the – and he's younger. You know, that that obviously, and he's younger. So I think you'd have to take Holmes. And I have no problem with that. Dur- I think Duran's going to have a monster year this year. Um, and like I said, if he works on a jump shot, even if it's just one or two a game, just to keep defenses honest – yeah. Dayton is my sleeper team of the year. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, any any thoughts on uh, Vescovy? Man, I would we love didn't to talk see. talked about before. Yeah, huh? I mean, nothing new. I just, he needs to do more than just shoot threes offensively. Um, you know, he's not a supreme athlete. Like, he's not a su- super good ball handler. A lot of times I watched him play LSU, Texas, and it might have been Alabama as well. And you can just tell sometimes people are just more athletic than him. You know, he would drive, they'd be into a spot, he'd kind of pick up his dribble, they'd strip him. 
Um, I mean, obviously he can shoot. He has NBA range, but again, it's kind of a catch and shoot thing. He's not taking guys off the dribble, creating his own separation. It's, you know, the defense collapses for a rebound and he gets tapped out to him and he catches and shoots. Um, there's some some solid passing ability there. I mean, I watched him make some very nice pocket passes and bounce passes through a, like a, a, the lane that was heavily contested. But again, he's not really a playmaker. Um, defensively, he did kind of surprise me. There were a few times his lateral quickness is pretty sharp. Um, again, he's not overly big. I think he's he, maybe 6'2", 6'2", 6'3", at the biggest. Yeah. So he's not really going to, you know, shut you down. But there were a few times, I mean, I was really impressed with just the lateral quickness and just kind of willingness to stay in front of the ball, active hands. At one point as the shot clock, actually the half was expiring against LSU. I mean, he literally was in a complete isolation for the entire last 15 seconds of that half and not only poked the ball loose, but, you know, basically single-handedly trapped the guy against the sideline and then forced up a contested three. So, you know, I, the prospects aren't great. He's just not unique enough offensively, and he doesn't do enough with the ball in his hands. You know, Rich, we talked about it. he has to take on more ball res- ball handling and passing responsibility. We know he can shoot, but he made that comment. He's like, you know, hey, we asked him, what do you want to add to your game? He's like, uh, I just want to shoot more. No, well, like, yeah, no we, we asked him <laughs> what he was working on. Working on. Uh, he said he was working on – first thing out of his mouth was shooting, which yeah. was surprising because that's the one part – he's already one of the best shooters in the game. Best in the country. Seven attempts <laughs> a game and hitting him at 41%. So, right. you know, but, hey, I, I get it. You know, sometimes it's hard. You know, in his head, he's probably thinking, I have a role to fill at Tennessee. I don't know how much his eyes are looking at the next level. I think that's a big thing in college is I've scouted guys is I think some guys become so comfortable in their role that they're like, what can I do to help? the Vols or the Zags yeah, or whoever I win. I don't know if it's so much, I think it's like a guy with Timmy, you know, your Mark, you know, few isn't gonna, isn't gonna move him. Isn't going to have him taking threes if he's unstoppable in the paint. You know? No, of course. Like that's your role. You do it so well. The Scotty right. shoots so right. well. I want you on the perimeter, catching and shooting. I don't want you driving to the rim. I don't want you playmaking. I want you shooting. So, right. Uh, so let's uh, finish up. The college stuff uh, by talking about San Jose State's Amari Moore, uh, who's six foot six, uh, shooting guard, small forward. Um, want to talk about Amari, Drew? Yeah, so I mean, Amari's a guy who's in my own backyard. Uh, I mean, I'm from the Bay Area. San Jose is probably 45 minutes max, more or less, from where I live. And when I talk about a lot of these guys, this is the roughest outline of any potential NBA player here. I think the guys we mentioned before. Um, all do something at an elite enough level. They're at these bigger name programs. Like there's, you can kind of, you can much easier see the, the NBA role there. Um, you know, Omari actually did work out for the Lakers. I believe he's from down that way uh, before he came back. And, you know, I'll start off by saying this. I, San Jose State's not good. They are not a good team. He is the driving force of literally everything they do on offense and defense. Um, so, you know, you, that has to be kind of filtered into the lens of reviewing him because he's carrying a massive burden, not just on one end, but on, on both. Uh, with that said, there's, like I said, it's a rough outline, but I, I think it's there. Um, his goal needs to be finding a way to kind of operate as a combo guard who can pick up some playmaking and ball handling duties, as well as look to score off the ball. And, you know, Rich and I talked about this, his turnover rate is atrocious i think it's brutal and yes some of that is the fact that he doesn't have any real teammates that can assist him in any way but at the same time that's still just kind of egregious um you know you want to start i guess on the negative side he's not a natural playmaker you know he's not you know we always hear the term passing guys open it's more i drive oh crap there's three guys here i pivot out and i just kick it out and hope to god someone cans a three on the flip side of that, there were plenty of times he made the right read. You know, he got some dribble penetration kicked out. And again, there's not a lot of talent and guys would just miss, I mean, wide open shots that, you know, at another program is getting canned, you know, nine times out of 10. Um, you know, defensively, again, I think I was impressed by the fact that in the games I scouted, he went heads up with uh, Hunter Maldonado from Wyoming, who's who's their best player. Um, he went heads up with Jalen um, uh, Jalen Williams from Santa Clara. 
which was actually the one where I was I was most impressed because I mean Jalen obviously we've interviewed him before and was drafted as a lottery pick and and yeah. looked good in summer league and physically I mean Jalen was the better athlete Jalen was the better player I'm not trying to compare them that way but he held his own in moments I mean it was highlighted by he made a really great read forced Jalen down the baseline and then Jalen kind of had to take a weird kind of angle to the rim and and Omari blocked it and so athletically I think he could could hold his own. The shooting is a question. I know a lot of people I talked to were really impressed by the raw box score. I mean, he shot 42% from three. Sounds amazing. He took two a game. Right. Pretty low volume. Yeah. And you look at... I, I thought it was... I, it was definitely under three, but I thought it was more like 2.8 or something like that. But it was definitely under it was, three. I think it was even... It might have been closer to under two and a half. But I would have to double check that. But it was under three a game. And when you talk about these shooters, I mean, we talk about Sasser and Viscovi. Those guys are shooting eight. Seven eight a game. It was two point six. Two point six. Okay, so kind of right in the middle. Then, um, you know, we talk about Sasser, we talk about Viscovi as as NBA shooters or at least NBA range, and those guys are shooting seven eight a game at just as good, if not a better percentage. So, you know, Amari's got a lot of stuff. I would love to see him just refine. I think the outline is there. He's a good enough athlete. Uh, he could hold his own defensively. You know, he's a capable enough ball handler, but man, I would have loved to see him leave San Jose state to be completely honest, because he can't find a role there because his role is everything. I would have loved to see him go even in the mountain West. You know, we talk about Matt Bradley, go play there, you know, maybe next to Matt Bradley who can take away some of that scoring responsibility. And maybe you can work a little bit more on, I want to facilitate and defend. I just go to a place where you can find a role because everything is great on paper. But when you do everything, but also have the stench of, oh, you have an insanely high usage rate, which is not going to happen in the NBA. Your turnover rate's not is awful. People are going to start questioning. Your team doesn't win. I think they lost like 14 in a row at one point. Um, <laughs> and their conference is good. The Mountain West gets slept on a lot. I'm a big Mountain West believer. But I see it in Omari. I see, like I said, the outline is there. I watched them go heads up with good players in the country. I watched them go heads up with a future lottery pick and not look, not get embarrassed. But – it's going to be hard to make a call on him come draft day because you're going to just be like, are you putting up numbers because your team is just really, really bad and you're the only guy who's competent? Or are you putting up numbers because you can overcome by yourself and you just, you didn't have any support. And, you know, on draft day, I'm not taking that gamble when this is a guy you could probably get on a summer league team or unrestricted, you know, sign him after the draft. But there's an outline there. I'll give him that. Yeah. My thoughts is, Amari, you know, I think he only averaged, uh, well, I'll give you the exact numbers, uh, 13.2 a game. Yeah. I think what you're going to see from this year is probably get up to 15, maybe 16, mm-hmm. 17. Uh, hopefully he cuts back on those turnovers. But then I still don't think he's draftable. I think Agreed. then he has to go to a team that it doesn't have to be North Carolina. It could be, like you said, San Diego State, somewhere where he where he can show – um, that he can do more than just score, um, and be able to play, and that will that will help him defensively. It will help mm-hmm. him as a playmaker, you know, to be surrounded by better players. And so, I think that's going to be the, <clears throat> the stage of his development this year. You know, he's probably going to be like you know in the talk for maybe you know Mountain West Player of the Year. Then next year he goes to a better school. Uh, and then, then I think he might be draftable. You know, the kid's definitely uh, his stroke. I think is solid. I like you said, ball handling's not bad. Athletic, athletically, uh, he he's good, not outstanding, but his vertical. He's very ver- vertically explosive. Mm-hmm. I like that. Really quick off the ground, um, but he definitely needs to improve his quickness, ball handling. Uh, and, and and those turnovers also needs to find ways to get to the rim better, but that will come with the yep. handle. You know, his, his lateral movement isn't super like, like he could stay with a guy like Matt Bradley. He was not the quickest guy in the world, Yeah, but he's going to be able to stay with people faster than that. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah. All right. So let's move on and we'll uh, talk. But can with... I contribute one, one part to this segment? Oh yes, please Absolutely, do. Hugh. I'm sorry. Absolutely. I'm sorry, Hugh. Go. I didn't mean go. to talk and cut you off. No, everybody listening. Go and check out these videos that Drew is putting together. I've been watching them, and they are high-quality edits. Both on LinkedIn, Andrew Barton. Check out his YouTube page. He does a really good job of breaking down these guys' games, highlighting pros and cons to their games, and they're just 
really well done. So, Drew, congratulations. You're doing really good work, mate. Keep it up. Everyone go watch. You here. And with Drew's permission, I'd like to put him also on the Hoops Prospects Absolutely. channel. Absolutely. So we're gonna, I'll send him so, over yeah. to you, Rich. We'll get them. Uh, we'll get all the. You already sent me two uh, previous ones we talked about, and I'll get them all up uh, in the next uh, a week or so. Absolutely. Um, so next up, uh, we have our uh, interview with Tyler Burton. Our special guest today is Tyler Burton, a six foot seven, two hundred and five pound senior forward from the University of Richmond. Last season, Tyler led the Spiders in both scoring and rebounding, and was an All Atlantic Ten selection. He averaged 16.1 points, 7.7 rebounds per game while shooting 46% from the floor, 37% from three, 79% from the free throw, free throw line. Um, he also finished in the top 20 in the country uh, with 230 defensive rebounds, 206 free throw attempts, and 163 free throws made. Both of them, by the way, led those last two numbers, uh, led the Atlantic 10. Tyler, thank you for joining us. Uh, how are you doing today? Doing well. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, we're excited. Um, so I was recently made aware uh, that you're recovering from an injury. Can you give us an update on your health? What is the injury? When did it occur? And when do you expect to be back on the court? Um, about a month ago, um, I... I was working out here. We had a little team workout going on and uh, I felt something funny in my knee. So I went and got an MRI and uh, they just told me that I had just a little cartilage buildup. So I just went in and had a little scope surgery, uh, quick and easy. Wasn't under the, wasn't under uh, anesthesia for too long, uh, quick surgery, quick and easy. And uh, yeah, I'm on my way back. I'm about 75, 80% right now. Should be back in the next couple of weeks. I'm really excited to get back out there with the guys, a lot of energy and uh, guys are flying around and excited to play. And I'm just happy I get to join them soon. Okay, great. So basically uh, a minor clean out of the knee, basically. Yep. Exactly. Okay, cool. All right, I'm going to pass you over to Drew. Right on, Tyler, man. Thanks for taking the time. Like I said, I know you guys are, you know, working out, getting ready for season and everything. Now that school is back in session. But, um, you know, this past spring, you kind of tested the draft waters. And, uh, you know, Rich and I had talked about it before you were at the uh, G League Elite Camp. We're just kind of curious, man. What was that process like for you? What did you learn? What was it like playing against some of the top upperclassmen in the country? How'd it go for you? Yeah, you know, well, to begin with, I mean, just unreal experience. It was so much fun. Um, you got to meet people, see people that you don't see on a regular basis. And uh, honestly, it's just something you dream about as a kid. Um, you know, you uh, everyone wants to play in the NBA. I think anyone who's ever picked up a basketball would hope and dream that they could play in the NBA. And just being that close to being able to do it was just really, really fun. And then just on a daily basis, being able to compete with those guys, like you said, the top guys in the country, top upperclassmen in the country. It was just so much fun to kind of test my game, see where I stand, see how I feel and where my confidence lies in myself and, and where I am moving forward. So, yeah, just overall, it was just a great experience. I had a lot of fun. You get any kind of feedback that you're planning on, you know, working into your game this year, you know, after talking to scouts, guys like that? Yeah, absolutely. Just just being a vocal leader, coming back bigger, stronger, faster than I did last year, shooting the ball better, being more of a defensive presence, being more dominant on the court overall and just being a forceful player. Uh, would man. definitely would definitely help me uh, expand my game, expand my role, expand as the person, really, and then hopefully that would lead to the next level. Right on, man. You know, Tyler. Last season, uh, you helped the Spiders uh, win the A10 championship in the tournament. Then uh, led the team to a first round win over the Big Ten champion Iowa Hawkeyes in the NCAA tournament. And you scored uh, 18 points and collected a game high 11 rebounds in that game. Um, the team's run run ended at the second round versus Providence. But even so, I would I would assume you know your run through the A10 tournament and then beating Iowa, which uh, broke a lot of brackets and not many people expected i assume that that run uh was probably one of the highlights of your career um is that true it's a highlight of my life okay <laughs> right all right there. so my so my my question then was going to be you know what what particular memories did you, did you take away from from that particular run last march yeah so uh on a more personal level i think the most fun part about that was uh the day before the Iowa game, uh, we had a practice and um, not sure how my dad did it, but he finagled a way to just kind of come down the tunnel with us. So he was right in our locker room, right around there. And it was a great scene just because uh, 
he had played in the final four and that's just all I kind of heard growing up. And, and that was kind of my dream and aspiration was just kind of just be in that March Madness and just be like him. And uh, like a lot of guys have parents like that, that have gone through it and whatnot. But for me to be able to experience that with him right by my side and uh, we got to take a picture in front of the March Madness banners, just being in the hallway, like going to and from media, going in, coming out and seeing him right there. I mean, that was just like an experience that you can't really even dream of. I mean, everyone gets to go or a lot of people get to go through it, but to be able to go through it with your dad, your mentor, someone that you've looked up to and taught you everything that you know to this day. And to be able to do it with him right by my side was just beyond a dream come true. Wow. I, I didn't realize that your dad played. Uh, so I, I didn't plan on asking this, but let's follow <laughs> up on that. Um, where did your dad play and who, who did he, uh, um, and what, what's his, what's his full name? Yeah, so my dad's name is Quentin Burton. Uh, it's funny because I usually like to leave my own legacy. Everyone usually asks me about him, but now I guess this is the first time I get to talk <laughs> about him. So I might hype him up a little bit right here. But uh, yeah, so he's from Columbia, Maryland. He uh, was a McDonald's All-American. Uh, he went to Providence College. Uh, they went to the Final Four his freshman year. And then I'm um, pretty sure they made the tournament uh, the other three years after that. Was that under Patino? Yes, sir. He's uh, Patino's recruit. Yeah. Nice, nice. Right well, I, I I should have done a little more research. Uh, so I apologize. <laughs> I didn't good. realize that. Um, wow, that's that's something else. So and then uh, so then his alma mater are the guys that knocked you out. Um, yeah, yeah, that was a <laughs> tough pill to swallow. But uh, yeah, I yeah. was going to say he probably had some a little. I mean, I know he was rooting for you, and no question about that. But uh, then I suppose he ha he kind of went back to rooting for his alma mater. I suppose. Oh yeah, yeah. It was. Uh... I don't know. He had a black and white hat on. He had a Richmond hoodie on, but a black and white hat. On. So I don't really know who he was sharing. Oh, but, oh, but, uh, oh but, man! But you no, remember yeah. that? You remember that when it's time to put him in a home? <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'm gonna pass it back to Drew. Yeah, man. So. Tyler, you guys had a really good squad last year. And in general, man, you know, Rich and I talk about this all the time. It's one of the things, you know, being college hoops guys is nobody ever talks about how good the A-10 is. I mean, it's you guys, VCU, Dayton, um, Davidson. You guys, it's a it's a loaded conference. And you guys had a good squad last year. Um, and with that being said, I know you guys are losing, uh, is it Jacob? Jacob Gilliard's gone, uh, Grant Golden. And then uh, is Nate Nate is Nate gone? Is also Nate Kyle? So that's what three super seniors. So, you know, outside of yourself, obviously, you know, who do you see kind of picking up the slack and helping you guys keep momentum and you know, get back to the tournament next or this year? Yeah. So um, uh, Matt, Matt Grace uh, came up with some huge plays that got us into the tournament to begin with. Um, and I think that's just a flash of what he's capable of. I've been seeing him every day for the past four years and he's unbelievable. Um, a lot of people might not know that, but he's unbelievable. He's so good at passing the ball, dribbling the ball, shooting the ball. He's six, nine. So um, I think he's going to make a lot of noise, open a lot of eyes. It's not going to be really a surprise to me because I have so much respect and am such a fan of his game. I also think Jason Nelson is going to come along really well. Freshman, um, he's been playing really well. He can handle the ball. His vision is unbelievable. And he's just really composed. And I just remember when I came in as a freshman, I wasn't very composed. I was eager. I was moving too quick. I was a little shaky. But um, I think he's going to be really good. And I think he has a chance to make a huge impact on this team this year. To follow up on that, uh, your freshman season, uh, just I'm just throwing this in for people who don't know your game. Um, you have basically you started slowly, and every year you've made significant progress. So uh, to the point where you caught a ton of people's attention, including NBA scouts. But uh, moving on to my next question, you know, with all these new faces, do you expect your role to change at all? Um, you know, you're catch and shoot guy, but you can do a little bit of everything, handle the pick and roll, uh, go ISO, uh, post up. Um, so do you do it, anticipate doing anything new? Uh, for example, do you expect maybe to play more on the ball? Yeah, you know, um, kind of just whatever the team needs me to do. Um, that's, that's was my mindset when I decided to return to school was, um, I think I can take on the challenge. I believe in myself and um, I just believe that I can come here and lead this team into something just as great, if not greater than what we accomplished last year. Um, that's just where my confidence lies with myself. But yeah, I, I also like the challenge. You know, uh, some people might not think that I can come in and lead this group. Uh, some people might not think I'm good enough to be able to do something, but I think that this is a great challenge for myself 
that I can prove to the world and just keep steadily improving like I have. And that's always been the name of my game is just focusing on what I need to do to help my team and help myself grow both on and off the court. And I just think that that's really what's going to be called upon this year is just my leadership role in expanding. Okay. I'm going to pass you back to Drew. Yeah, Tyler. So, I mean, we kind of hit it at it when we did the intro. I mean, you got a really well-rounded game, whether it's your efficiency, putting the ball in the bucket, crashing the glass, you know, and Rich kind of hinted on this last question. But if there's one aspect of your game that this year you could make a big jump in, you know, playmaking, getting those shooting numbers up even more, like what's the one thing that you're really hoping to improve this year, not just for the NBA scouts, but just for, you know, your personal game as a whole? Yeah, for me, um, last year I thought I was pretty shaky on defense. So I would put defense right at the top of that list, but also, you know, tied for number one, I would put expanding my my ability to shoot the ball, I think being able to put the ball in the basket, shooting and being able to just lock down the best player on the other team. I think those are the two most important things I have in mind for myself this year. And then, I mean, I, I know you're dealing with injury right now. Has that kind of impacted your training and plans or, you know, you're still finding ways to get out there and, you know, work on the things you want to work on? Yeah, no, I mean, obviously it's a little bump. I'm, I'm obviously not at 100 percent, so I can't go out there and I can't compete with my teammates like they were just doing 30 minutes ago, you know. But um, I wouldn't say that it's too much of an alteration um, of kind of the path I'm on. I, I think it was a minor surgery, like I said, minor injury. So uh, it, it didn't it's not putting me out for crazy amounts of time where I'm going to lose a rhythm or lose my ability to do anything. Um, I'm just building back up slowly and, and just getting back to where I was and just going to keep improving and building off that. Absolutely, man. Can you uh, – we're going to switch gears here and tell us a little bit what, what – who you're like off the court. Like, you know, what are your some favorite things to do is, you know, for fun um, and things of that nature? Something, you know, that most people, you know, wouldn't know about you and, you know, from watching you just on the yeah. basketball court. Yeah, so uh, for me, I like to watch a lot of TV, hang out with my friends. I mean, my teammates are my best friends, uh, especially around here all the time, all this time we spend together. Um, I, I love to hang out with those guys. Uh, the apartment complex we live in, we got a, we got a pool, so we like to nice. go sit poolside with all the hot weather going on. Hopefully we're going to enjoy it uh, a little bit more before the, before the winter comes and it's time to get into the season. But, um, yeah, right now we just really uh, – we'll just – Go to class, go get some food together, hang out, laugh, joke, listen to music, play video games at night. And uh, if we got any free time during the day with the sun up or even at nighttime, we just go hop in the pool and just have a good old time. Nice, nice. You said you you opened up with TV. Is there any particular show you're uh, watching right now? Uh, right now, my roommates are getting me into Game of Thrones. I'm, ah! I'm, I'm getting ah. into it a little bit. I'm getting into it go. a little bit. Um, it's a That'll little different from shows I watch. Yeah, that's what everyone yeah. says. So different. what do you think? What do you typically watch? Uh, my favorite show uh, to watch just to, like to have on or if I'm just hanging with my friends is Entourage. That's that's my favorite show. But um, I love Stranger Things. I just finished that a couple oh, weeks yeah. ago. I exactly. love Stranger Things. One. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I could watch Stranger Things <laughs> almost all the time. But Entourage is definitely my number one. Okay. That's good. Right. You got good taste in shows, man. Good Appreciate taste in that. shows. Appreciate that. So kind of staying on the personal train, you know, you grew up, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Massachusetts, right, area? Uh, you know, went to high school in Connecticut. So what attracted you to uh, head down to, to Richmond? Uh, yeah, so my family, uh, my grandparents and aunt in particular, they live um, they live right in D.C., which is about an hour right. 30 to two hours from here. So for me growing up, it was always great. Our vacations, our family vacations were to go see my grandparents. We would just go down to Maryland and we would visit for about a week. And I loved it, loved it here. And uh, I just always wanted them to be able to see me play more and be able to spend more time with them. And then I also have family members in Richmond, Virginia, cousins as well. Uh, so it's, it was just a great opportunity for me. I mean, Coach Mooney believed in me from the get-go. It was a prestigious university. Um, the class sizes are small, which caters to me uh, in a perfect way. But um, overall, I just wanted to be able to just see that side of the family more and go to a warmer climate too. So uh, that, that was really all that it came down to. It was just a bunch of things just stacked on top of one another. And I was like, why not just go right here? So, no, uh, yeah, sure. my grandparents come to a ton of games. My cousins come to every game. So it's just a great family experience because I got my friends and I got my family right here. And I really couldn't ask for more. Oh, yeah, man. That's awesome. What's your what's your major, by the way? Uh, business administration. Okay. All righty. Um, 
I wanted to major in that, but I ended up in econ because my school didn't have it. So, but anyway, I digress. Um, <laughs> I, I, I had a wrap up question for you, but something, uh, you know, um, occurred to me. Uh, so I'm going to throw this in there. I was just curious, you know, you, you went from, you know, kind of being pretty much off the radar to you gained a lot of momentum, I'd say, in the second half of last season. How is it for you as a player? I mean, what made you say, you know what, I'm going to declare. I mean, do, do you do you hear the announcers saying, you know, NBA scouts are interested in this guy? Or do do people tell you, like, you know, the SID, does he say, you know, NBA scouts are here to look at you? Or uh, do you actually go to sites like ours and see where you're ranked? I mean, how did it, how did you make, how did you know that you were actually a viable candidate for the draft? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So for me, so let's begin with, every time I watch film, it's, mute that I don't hear the commentators or really anything so no I, I don't really hear the commentators say anything about that but um you know I just believed in myself um my dad played college basketball uh so he's, he's a pretty good mind when it comes to understanding the game and, and being honest with yourself and uh, I just did a really honest assessment and I thought that maybe I did have a chance um and if not it's an unreal experience and um as a basketball player you only get one chance to go through the whole experience. So I was like, why not just put my name in? And uh, I got great feedback. Uh, I, I even learned a lot about myself going through the process uh, where I do believe I, I can reach that next level. And uh, I do believe I will reach that next level. And yeah, it was just a great experience. And I just think in my head, I was just a decision I made and I didn't really have any serious reasoning to it. I thought I played pretty well last year and uh, I just believed in myself and wanted to give it a go. All right. That's the best way to do it. Um, you know, yeah. Believe in yourself. Um, I, I, you know, I had another thought. I got a question for you though. Oh, okay. I was thinking, I gotta, I love it. So, you know, um, obviously you guys, you know, like we said, conference is a lot tougher than people give you guys credit for, you know, you guys are the reigning champs, you know, who do you think is the biggest threat this coming year for you guys, you know, defend your A-10 title and like, who, what player are on a more personal level are you looking forward to match up against? Um, that's a good question. I mean, for me, I just want to run the table. You know, okay. I don't have a player in mind. I just want to beat everybody yeah. that comes on that court with me. So right I, I haven't really had a necessarily target uh, on my back. Or uh, we have a target on our backs, but I haven't had really a target that I'm out for. I just want to win every single game with the opponent against the opponent on the court, really. Yeah, man, right on. Alrighty, so last question, and uh, you've probably been asked this a bunch of times already. Uh, what are your expectations for the team? I mean, you have you have a you set a high bar last year. So, what are your expectations uh, for the team this coming season? I love where we're at. Um, I think we're going to be great. I think we have a chance to be unbelievable, and I like that people are overlooking us. I love it. I love that people are overlooking us, and I think we have a chance to be unbelievable this year and make a lot of noise and change a lot of opinions and prove a lot of people wrong. And uh, I love it. Uh, I'm watching these guys every single day. They bring energy. They bring passion. They want to learn. They want to get better. And that's exactly who I am as a person. And I just can't wait to get back out there with them. And we can just keep building and keep rolling because I think we're going to turn a lot of heads and make a lot of noise this year. All righty. Great answer. Great answer. Tyler, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, we wish you and the spiders, you know, the best this season. And, uh, Please come back and visit us, you know, after the season if you have time. Also, I'm going to say to our listeners, uh, we didn't talk about it, but Tyler's got some major hops. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you do. You have some impressive dunks out there on YouTube. So, people, if you haven't seen him, go check out Tyler. He can definitely put the ball uh, through the rim. All right, Tyler, thanks again. Thank you, guys. I appreciate right on, it. Man. Of course. And now it's time for our mailbag. And this is the last episode of season one. Also Hughes' last episode. So um, we're going to let Hugh take the first question. Uh, though you, I don't believe you were one of these guys. He comes from Darius and he writes, uh, earlier this summer, a few of you guys said the Celtics were the team to beat for the NBA championship with Gallinari. Uh, 
done for the season. He tore his Daniello uh, Gallinari tore his uh, ACL recently. Uh, so with him done for the season, are you guys still sticking with that prediction? And there's a second part to it. He says, also, who do you think will be Boston's starting five? So, Hugh, I'm going to give you a first crack at this. I don't know if you're one of those guys saying Boston was the team to beat in the NBA. I know I think I know I was, and I think Connor was the other person. Yeah, I, I don't think I was one of those guys, and I think it would be remiss of me to say that I don't think the Milwaukee Bucks are winning the NBA championship <laughs> this year. Uh, I truly I, I truly believe in that, though. I mean, clearly a quality team. Everybody understands the talent that they have. Um, so I think they're the team to beat. Um, but regards to the starting five in Boston, that's a really good question. I think Malcolm Brogdon obviously gets to start at the point now. Um, that's their big move in the offseason that ultimately wasn't really a massive move, but was a clear win for the Celtics to address uh, something they needed. Uh, and then I think I see Smart, obviously, at the two, being that defensive guard, can also handle some of the ball handling responsibilities. And then you're going to have Tatum and Jalen Brown as inter-switchable threes and fours. And then at the five, it comes down to, do we want to start our Horford or Grant Williams? I think that's not Grant oh, Williams, Robert, Rob Williams. Robert, Robert, Robert yeah. Robert Williams. Uh, and I think that, I mean, who knows how Al Horford's feeling? I think that will start as Al Horford. Or who knows how can, Robert Williams is feeling too. Cause... True. I mean, that that's the luxury that they have is they can use both of them and they can even use lineups where they put both of them in at the same time. So, I think they, I mean, everybody knows they have a lot of really good pieces in Boston and they can play around with that lineup, but that would make the most sense probably with Al Horford at the five, in my opinion, as their night one starting lineup. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm, I, I was with uh, Hugh. I was on the, the Bucks train uh, before the Celtics. I think they're going to be in the Eastern Conference Finals and I think that goes seven games, but I've got the Bucks just because Giannis is, in my opinion, Giannis is generational. Um, we're talking about a guy who's quickly trending to top 15, and who knows from there. But besides the point, um, I think the Celtics are still going to be really good. Uh, wouldn't surprise me if they make another run at it. Um, I'm, I'm with Hugh. I'm going to have to go with Brogdon at the one because the biggest thing they were missing last year was like a kind of a true point guard. Smart can handle the ball, but he can't handle the responsibility of having to run an offense. Um, so you got Brogdon at the one, you know, Solid score, plays with a good IQ, good pace of play, can shoot. Uh, you got smart at the two because that defensive intensity, kind of how Steph and Clay, Clay would always take the hardest assignment defensively, not comparing the two skill wise, but like that's going to be smart's job is you're going to key in on whoever the number one on the perimeter is. That's your job for the night, take them out of the game. Right. Um, Jalen and, and Tatum, again, like again, you hit it on the head. Whoever wants to play three, whoever wants to play the four, at this point in the NBA, it doesn't really matter. It's kind of one and the same. I would go Robert Williams at the starting five uh, just because I think he doesn't have the refined offensive game. But between Tatum, Brown, and Brogdon, you don't need as much of an offensive punch. I think Robert Williams is very quickly becoming one of the better defensive bigs in the league. And then you look at their bench, man. I mean, Gallinari sucks to lose because, you know, he gives you floor spacing, veteran leadership, you know, pretty solid IQ as a player. But you've got Horford, Derek White, Peyton Pritchard, J.D. Davidson, um, Grant Williams. I mean, they got a pretty good bench. I feel like I'm missing one or two players as well. Um, but regardless, I mean, they've got a really, really good eight, nine-man rotation that can all get minutes. Um, yeah. And, I mean, they're going to they're gonna be tough, but I do have the Bucks winning it because Giannis is that kind of an obstacle for teams. Do we think that with, with Brogdon now, they have the best defensive backcourt in the league? Oh. Yeah. That's tough. Yeah. It's up there. Smart. My only issue is Brogdon's been bang, banged up with Nick, like, tic tac injuries. I don't know how much of that is like Indiana's just not that good. So they're just kind of like, I'll oh, let him over, they kind of just over rest him. But they're mm -hmm. up there. But if Brogdon can stay healthy, then, then, then it's hard to say no. Yeah, great. My, my take on this question is, you know, with Gallinari gone, you know, it does leave them uh, a little bit of a hole at uh, small forward if that's where he was going to play right now. You know, behind Tatum and Brown, you really don't have anybody beside Grant Williams um, that you can count on. So I really think they are going to get some kind of special injury dispensation mm -hmm. for him. Uh, they won't be able to sign uh, the same kind of caliber player. I think it's like half of whatever they yeah. were paying Gallinari. Um, but uh, so I do think they need to fill a hole there. I won't make my NBA prediction right now. I, I still have Boston in the running, but I, I think this does hurt. 
Uh, and I agree with your starting five. Um, well, I mean, we, we're all kind of wishy-washy on the center, and I think that's the one question mark. I, my feeling would be the team has to basically – uh, I think you'll probably get the minutes pretty evenly divided between Horford and Williams. Uh, you definitely want to make sure they're both healthy and Horford's up there in years and Williams mm-hmm. has an injury history. So I think you want to balance that out. So neither gets overworked. Um, so, yeah. Uh, in the speaking of which over the next few weeks leading up to the start of the NBA season, we are going to be previewing all the divisions and then our final show, the week that the season starts, we'll be going over our predictions for NBA championship and so forth. So uh, join us for that. And then you'll hear my uh, my prediction on the Eastern Conference and Western Conference Finals and NBA champion. Uh, but right now I'll say I'm sticking with the Celtics, but I, I uh, want to leave the option to change my mind before the season starts. <laughs> so um, we already got Kyle's question on the Nets. Uh, the next one is from Jennifer, and she asks, which team is the worst-run oh. organization in the NBA? Uh, Drew, you seem to be ready to – Oh, to my God. Tip your tongue. This is this and is Hugh, too And easy. Hugh doesn't want to answer this because he's thinking, if I ever leave the Bucks, <laughs> Yeah, exactly. I got to be careful here. Uh, what are they going to – it's okay. This is the wor- I'm claiming the worst team. I don't want to work for them anyways. No, it's the Knicks. It has to be the Knicks. I don't. Ooh. I don't. I don't think. Look, you can talk about Sacramento, and I think Sacramento definitely isn't. I wouldn't say because the Sacramento, it's more like an incompetence thing where it's just kind of you're just like, oh, you aren't basketball people are trying to do basketball. Like it's more incompetent than like I think the worst run. You are the New York Knicks, and all and I'm here. You probably can agree to this. All we've heard growing up. Oh, the market. Everyone wants to play in the garden. It's such a big market. And they still can't get anybody. They still can't be relevant. Um, it's the ownership, man. Cam Reddish doesn't even want to play there. Dolan <laughs> is a poison that you cannot overcome. It's the same thing in football. The Cowboys cannot overcome Jerry Jones. They're not the worst run franchise in the NFL, but Jerry Jones is just toxic. You can't overcome him because he's at the head. Dolan is toxic. You can't overcome him when your leader is so deluded and is just, you know, so into his own, his own self. You know, you look at the top organizations, what does the ownership have in common? You probably can't name them. I don't know who the owner for the Spurs is. Do you guys know? I don't know who the owner for the Spurs is. I don't know. The, I don't know who the owner for the Bucks is. The Warriors is a little bit different because, you know, they're, they've been, they kind of have such a high, high rise and they're my local team. But like, you think about like who owns the Celtics, you can't name them because they know that it's not their job to draft, scout, you know, put players out there, recruit free agents. They, they put the right people in charge. The Knicks don't do that. And you have the New York market. That's why I can't say like the magic in Sacramento. I expect the magic out in Orlando to flounder. I expect Sacramento and Sacramento to have a hard time. But you are in New York. You are at the Mecca, and you still suck. So it's got to be the Knicks. <laughs> Let's hear Hugh's political answer. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to be incredibly politically correct here with the way I answer this question. I think, I, I, for me right now, it's kind of hard to pick a team to answer this because I think, say, like the Sacramentos, the New Yorks, the, the few franchises that for the past four or five years we've all collectively agreed aren't doing a great job. I could say at least this offseason, those teams have made positive steps. Now, the Knicks, we're yet to find out how Jalen Brunson is going to look as a basically a max contract guy. And obviously, they just re-signed RJ Barrett and they sort of lost out on the chance to get Donovan Mitchell by probably being too impatient. Um, but I still think that the, the acquisition of Jalen Brunson for them is a positive step. That's a step in the right direction for New York. Who knows how it's going to end up. But And then Sacramento, like, of the past, haven't had great off-seasons, haven't been able to do much at all. But this off-season actually made some really nice moves, in my opinion. Got some good players, some good role players, and I expect them to be better this coming year. So I'm not going to pick a team. I don't think – I'm not going to answer a worst-run team in the league. Um, There's definitely teams that are run better than others. But I think, like I said, this past year, teams that that we have sort of all agreed aren't doing a great job, improved a little bit, did a better job. So I just hope that trend can continue for those teams. Wow. I wish I'm, I wish I'm not people, getting off the fence. I wish on this people one. could see what I'm doing right now. Giving 
Oh, Hugh, two dude. thumbs down for the most political answer. I ever. got I got enough hot takes for both of us, Hugh. Don't worry. I can give you a <laughs> Don't even get me started on the Lakers. If we want to go to recent memory, it's the Lakers. But I'm going with the Knicks for the long period of time. It's got to be the Knicks. Well, I'm going to go with more recent period of time. And this team was in the Western Conference Finals not too long ago. And I look at their drafts and I'm just like, what the heck is this team doing? And I'm talking about the Portland Trailblazers, also some of the moves that they've made. Uh, this team just is this, seems- a, is this a Mike Schmidt dig? Huh? <laughs> What's that? Is this an attack on Mike Schmidt? Well, then that's what they, you know, they brought him in to do. The help of the draft, and God help them if they think that's going to help. Because, uh, yeah, um, maybe um, he'll surprise. He'll, maybe he'll surprise me, but uh, I'm not. I'm not a big believer in in Mike Schmitz. To all NBA teams, if you're looking for someone to come in in a GM, assistant GM role, and then go pick a shade and sharp, I'm free. Any day of the week, <laughs> I will make that draft pick for you and take yeah, well, full credit. Doesn't look, require look that much email. skill. They're big. <laughs> they're big. Look at their big free agent signing was Gary Payton, the second. I should... <laughs> they'll hey, probably they also, they'll probably also sign Gary Payton Sr. before it's all said and done. But, I mean, just look at these draft picks. I mean, it's like uh, Shaden Sharp, Nazir Little, Greg Brown, um, you know, Trendon uh, Waterford. I mean, we're talking about all these guys had huge question marks, huge red flags, and they all end up on Portland. They're all on Portland. I mean, yep. I mean, uh, and, and even that, have, that athlete, the athlete that was from Tennessee, that was at the Clippers. Um, Keon, Keon Johnson, Keon Johnson, Keon Johnson. Anthony Simons he, had he didn't issues. Have, he didn't have question marks. He didn't have question marks about. We're talking about character question marks with all these other guys I brought up. Rich, uh, am I mistaken? Didn't Anthony Simons have some issues too in college? He wasn't in college. He was right. Or, out of yeah, not in college. Yeah, I, I, out, I, I don't. Oh, I don't know enough about his background to say that. I could have sworn. Maybe, maybe it's just because he came out of high school. But I could have sworn I, someone said something that there was like an issue why he didn't go to college. But I could be reading into that too much. Yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I do like the, them getting Grant. You know, uh, in the offseason, I, I love Josh Hart, and I think they need more players like those two guys. Of course, you know, they're paying Damian Lillard, you know, over $40 million a year, which is going to kill them. And, um, you know, like I said, their big free agent signing was uh, Gary Payton. Excuse me. Who overpaid for him as well. Right. And There's then, something at, to be said about that. And right now they have 19 guys on their roster, including their Exhibit 10s. Those Exhibit 10s are Isaiah Miller not an NBA player. Jared Roden, perhaps, you know, definitely G League player right now. Uh, Devontae Cook uh, played for the Lakers for a couple mm-hmm. years. Uh, um, he's not an NBA player. And Olivio Saar, I'm not even sure, you know, he he's be a good European player. And not just – Saar has the talent. He's just soft as hell. I, he's super soft. Um so I think one thing one thing we can all agree that did do uh, the was draft Jabari Walker. Yeah, yeah. I didn't bring up Jabari because that's yeah, I like Jabari Walker. Um and I think they got him uh a lot he was like 59th pick in the draft or 57th, whatever. Yeah. Uh and and I think they got him where most people thought he was gonna be an early second rounder. You know, I had so, him going much earlier than that. Yeah, yeah. so so yeah, I'll, I'll give you that. But uh, right now, I think they're the most poorly run organization, and I really bring, think bringing some guy from TV and who made a lot of you know, I could be wrong, but it seems to me that Mike always made a lot of his rankings based on what other people told him, not his own opinion. Um. And it was just funny how guys would just jump around. I can remember, you know, right after the NCAA tournament, who's the good guy who plays for Oral Roberts, the little guard? Max a- Avis. Yeah, right, right. He went from being nowhere, and he had him as a first-round pick after the NCAA tournament. What? No Come way. on. Yeah. The guy was no one of the way. leading scorers in the country, and all of a sudden now you think he's – a top 30 pick. And of course we didn't do that. You know, um, he was like in our top 200 and then maybe he was like, we had him if in he, our yeah. top 100, you if know, if he was going to be a top one player, he would have went, he didn't, wouldn't have come back yeah, to school again. Yeah. Like and what does yeah. that say about you that you had to watch, you know, like four games of his career and all of a sudden now he's a first round pick. 
you weren't watching before. That's what it says. So I, I don't yeah. know. And in and, 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 and ESPN, he had far more resources than most of us, you know, doing what we do. And yet yep. he does stuff like that. So, all right. Uh, I'm going to get on a rant here. Uh, so I'll stop. <laughs> don't want to, I don't want to upset Hugh for his last show. Um, so our last question and an interesting question is from Frankie who wants to know, are you guys doing M- any NBA fantasy stuff in the preseason? And the answer is yes, we are. Um, like I said, over the next four shows, we're going to go back to weekly. Uh, in two weeks, we'll go back to weekly, and over uh, those four weeks, we're going to be doing. Uh, gonna, we're going to break up the divisions, do a couple divisions or a few divisions each show, and then we're going to have our season preview show. And through there, we will we'll do. We will uh, talk about NBA fantasy stuff, in the sense of you know this player should be have a breakout year, that kind of thing. And we may, if Drew Drew uh, wants to help me put the time into it, we may even come up with a cheat sheet. A fantasy draft cheat sheet before the season if Drew's up for it. Yeah, I could I could be interested in that, folks. I love fantasy sports. I'm a big fan, big proponent of fantasy football. I'm kind of a degenerate when it comes to it. I had to send my boy Hugh a cheat sheet that I made up for football. <laughs> uh, love fan, fantasy basketball. Love it. So yeah, yeah, Drew, thank you very much. That cheat sheet came in very handy in the drop. I actually just texted the group chat in my team, so maybe after the show you can let me know how it went. Absolutely, I will give you a draft grade. But I love NBA fantasy is fun, man. You gotta you gotta have a competitive league because if not, it gets a lot of hand. If you really know what you're doing, and nobody else does. Um, but yeah, you know, I, I'm down. I love fantasy sports. Excellent. For those of you who don't know, for uh, ten years I ran a, a website called fantasyfootballexperts.com or it was called ffex.com uh and obviously we did nothing but nfl fantasy football uh then i switched gears and came over to the to the uh not the dark side i came over to the bright side the best yes. side basketball and basketball, uh, baby. this will be the first time we actually really touched on fantasy but uh, yeah we will we will do some of that in the preseason for sure and maybe even if you have fantasy questions during the season, we can you can run them by us. All right. So great questions this week, folks. I really appreciate it. If you want to send send us a question, make sure to email it to admin, A-D-M-I-N, at hoopsprospects.com. I want to thank our special guest, Tyler Burton, uh, plus all of our listeners. And, of course, this is final episode of season one, Hugh's final episode, which is very sad. And uh, we're going to try to make him feel guilty uh, about that for at least a month. Um, uh-huh. And uh, But we, Drew and I at least, and maybe others, will be back in two weeks to start the NBA season preview. And right after that, we'll move into the college season preview. So a lot of stuff coming up soon, folks. And we'll be back to weekly. Thank you, guys. What an honor. We love you, Thank Hugh. you for allowing me to be a part of it. What a summer it's been chatting hopes with you all. Yes, Hugh, um, we're very happy for you. And uh, at the same time, we uh, want to stay in touch because we're going to miss you. I'm like a proud dad right, right now. As a guest. All right. Next summer league, I'm on as a guest. Sure. Absolutely. Sure. I'm like a proud father right now. I'm tearing up. <laughs> 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 All right. That's it, folks. Um, you can uh, ask your questions. Email to admin at whosprospects.com about insider info about the Milwaukee Bucks. And no one will have any idea where I'm getting that info from. <laughs> no, 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 no.